Thank you very much. Um, my name is Boniface Molly, and uh, we're here to have a very a fun and, and uh, educative discussion about the challenges that HR practitioners um, face in this day and age. And uh, I have two guests uh, here with me today. I'm going to uh, invite them to introduce themselves, starting with you, Elina. Maybe you can let us know a bit about yourself, what you do, and uh, why you're here today. Usana. Asante, Boni. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, so my name is Elina Kabiru. I am the head of HR at Petika Kenya which is a sports betting company, an online sports betting company, currently the largest uh, and the biggest uh, sports betting company in Kenya. Good. Yes. Sana. Joyce? You're... Thank you. Thank you, Bonface. Uh, my name is Joyce Nyakundi. I'm head of human resources at East African Gas Oil Limited. We are a retail and a wholesale uh, oil and gas company across uh, East Africa. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Uh, given the high rate of unemployment, um, candidates really need to differentiate themselves uh, from the rest of the pack, you know. So it's not enough that you have, let's say if it's in this particular case, uh, an LLB from whichever institution, it's um, what do you bring, what's extra that you bring to the table. So it's more to do with maybe uh, your business etiquette starting with the way you do your applications because um, how you, when you do make an application, that is the first time an employer gets to interact with you um, from a very remote setting. But then what feel or what vibe do you give them? Do you give them the vibe of you're someone who's open to learning, someone who's um, self-aware, someone who has potential to grow within the company and also use whatever skills that you've learned, you know, from, from wherever it is you've gone to school. So you really need, and, and then they, you have to give them that edge where they look at you as um, someone who could quickly come and fit into the culture. <coughs> so it's more of your attitude and trying to match it uh, with what you think the, their culture is like. There are different people who can really make your CV, um, not in terms of content, but just how you present your content in a way that's easy and um, quick to read and also engaging, you know. Um, so you can use some buzzwords that you think can, you know, um, catch the employer's attention mm -hmm. um, and just, you know, putting your, a bit of maybe numbers or, 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 yeah. um, or short statements that really, really capture the audience's attention because again as you said sifting through 200 cvs is yeah, is a, lot, a of lot of work, work yeah. so i want to look at a cv that i also you know like yeah. what i see okay yeah, yeah so and even use matter, of, right? yes and even use of color of course not too much but yeah. just enough in, in in a professional way great yeah um and maybe um, joyce you can shed a bit of light or on what happens on the employer's side as alina said begins by the CV being attractive yeah, and also having the key areas of interest to the company. yeah. By the time we're advertising, we have a job description put out. That JD speaks about the position at length. Yeah? So by the time you're putting in your application, you need to look to it that it's really matching with the, what is being advertised for. Yeah? Uh, if the advertisement really matches, if the candidate's CV matches uh, the advertisement, at that point, the engagement begins. Yes, we have our recruitment softwares, uh, which we can give commands to, yeah, to delete or maybe to onboard uh, certain specifications that we need. So as we said, 200 applications can be too many. At that point, it keeps cutting to the number that you want based on the, on the specifications that you need in a candidate. At that point, you also engage uh, headhunters, yeah, recruiting companies who will come in handy uh, when we are also headhunting for candidates at that given time. So um, again, being a HR office meaning, uh, means that you have to collaborate with the hiring managers. So it could be, of course, in a, in, a, in a corporate setting, then you have the different managers within the different functions that exist in a company. And depending on who's asked uh, or who's uh, department is in need of the resource, then you need to work with them in as much as you've defined a JD already, 
to do the shortlist, yeah, because they also have, they are the technical experts actually in their area. And so for you, you'd be looking at what maybe is not, um, because of having the experience of looking at so many CVs and engaging so many candidates, you'd be able to maybe spot gaps in, in a CV uh, probably better than a, than a hiring manager. But in terms of just uh, whether they meet the minimum qualifications, um, for the role, then that you you also have to collaborate and, and, and allow allow the the manager to be able to do the shortlist. So once you do that, then mm. um, and you have agreed on the shortlist, um, and also agreed on what uh, assessment criteria or the screening criteria that you're going to use, then you go ahead and execute it. So it could start from probably written interviews depending on the role uh, because there are some roles that um, instead of doing oral interviews it may be best to first of all maybe give an assignment or you know a project or something because mm -hmm. you want to see the skill that that person has yeah so it's not enough that they just talk about it but it is also good that they show you um, through probably a uh, 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 project that you've given them, yeah. what the, it is that they can, yeah, yeah. yes, practically, okay. and because then you'd be judging apples with apples, you've yeah. be given one assignment to different people who have what you think are the right skills for the role, then you can see the originality in each uh, candidate's work. Okay. So, um, so that can, of course, you have your panel of interviewers who can then uh, look at the, um, assess the, the work and be able to then shortlist um, the right number into the next stage. So on like that, depending on um, role to role again, and even the seniority of the role, you could employ things like uh, psychometric tests, which have really come uh, in handy because there are also candidates who are interview ready. So they come and give you, you know, the right impression. They say the right thing. So, but then when you put them to task, uh, once you employ them, you notice there was a gap. So it, it, it all, um, the quality of the person who you end up with at the end of that process is really determined by the screening criteria that you use. Okay. So how practical or how relevant is it to the role and uh, also the variety so that you can keep sifting and just getting the, the, the people who you really, really need to take to the tail end of, of, of that of process. The process. Yeah. Having worked with uh, uh, the recruiting companies that, uh, through the softwares, um, it's really been helpful. It uh, fastens the process, isn't the process, and it also makes you get the right candidates yeah? because you're able to to really narrow down to the qualities that you need in a candidate. As Elena said, the employment rate is quite high. It is quite high. So in a given position, you can have people even with no academic background that really matches with the job that was uh, advertised for. However, you really need to narrow down from the 1,000 applications that you receive to five. So uh, the softwares have really been helpful to us over the years. And we really commend more HR practitioners to use softwares that are helpful to us. I think branding is absolutely important and critical because the same way an employer, sorry, the same way an employer is um, scouting for talent is the same way talent is also assessing, you know, um, these different employers and, you know, making a decision that I prefer this brand because it speaks to maybe my values or it's aspirational and I, it looks like a really, really nice, fancy place to work or I've had really good things about it. So you really can't underestimate the power of brand um, and even just brand visibility um, across the, your, your recruitment uh, assets as a, and even as a professional. Mm -hmm. um, I think just remaining authentic, you know, uh, as a brand, mm -hmm. um, and, and increasing um, the touch points that you have within the organization for your internal consumers who are your employees will really, really go a long way into making that brand sell, you know, because um, you may have fancy colors, fancy, you know, uh, logos, 
people may be everywhere, but um, say if you don't have that credibility and your your employees or your ex-employees could be your brand ambassadors or they could be your brand killers. Mm -hmm. So if they really truly believe in that brand as an employer brand, they will sell you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, most companies might not have been prepared for COVID as much and uh, most uh, were used to people working from the office. Uh, so a lot had to be done for people to really work remotely and also managing performance of staff remotely is not as easy. There are so many distractions outside but we are really looking to enhance the, 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 the working from home uh, idea. Even post-COVID it can be a really good and interesting uh, uh, way of really doing business and really uh, engaging staff. Uh, a way that we are doing, we are going about it to ensure that staff are able to work and productively uh, deliver from home is in, uh, have uh, tasks assigned to them timely. While at home, they can execute their task. At the end of every day, they are able to have a catch up session with their supervisors to just give a brief of how the day has been and also their achievements. Uh, the assignments can be uploaded in the different ERPs that the companies use and uh, line managers are able to assess the staff's productivity mm -hmm. daily, weekly, monthly. Most of the companies were caught off guard when, when COVID happened. We really uh, uh, didn't have a framework, you know, uh, or most employers didn't really have a framework for to support uh, remote working. However, um, almost two years in, um we've continued to draw some learnings from 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 this pandemic and first of all it's uh, to realize that um we have to change our mindsets as employers um to or even as hr professionals to accept that there's a new normal and the new normal may result in a hybrid approach to work arrangements where you have both uh, employees uh, coming physically to the office and also working from remote spaces. Um, it's also good to take stock of the different roles that are there in the organization and see which ones are, can practically be, you know, um, supported from home and which ones require that, you know, the employees come physically. Um, then also we have to rely on systems, you know, because uh, collaboration is important. And now uh, there's no call. There can't be really effective co collaboration without the power of technology and the systems. So how good uh, um, your collaborative uh, uh, systems are will determine also the productivity levels of the employees. So it's it's a combination of things. And um, but I truly think that that is just the future, and is that is that is now and also the future that we we need to accept that it's it's, it's here, there. <laughs> and it's, it's here and to it's, stay. At least it's going to be this way for. It's here to stay. Yeah. Oh, okay. and there's been a slight change, yeah, because uh, at the supervisor level, however much this is systemized, there are appraisal process. Uh, the practice was maybe you sit with your supervisor one on one as you take feedback again on every element of your task that you had. For this moment, appraisals had to be virtual, such that you, the, the supervisor is able to appraise you without really being with you and also giving you feedback virtually. Mm -hmm. um, I think every generation has their own uniqueness um, that they bring into the workforce. Um, and most of it is actually good um, because they say change is inevitable. So I guess most of the oldies, uh, when I say oldies, I mean the generation that precedes the younger one that comes, mm -hmm. looks at change not necessarily as a good thing because change is, is, is difficult, change is uncomfortable, you know. Uh, but then what I like that they brought into the workspace is uh, that versatility mm -hmm. to be um, who you can be both at the workplace and also know that you can still be another person, you know. So, uh, well, not in that sense, but well, let me give an example maybe to elaborate. So they, I, I see them embracing um, a can-do um, attitude, which is very good, and they don't necessarily want to rely on employers um, 100%. So they are happy to have their 
you know, be self-employed and still be employed in the same breath. So that's mm -hmm. what I meant by being two different people. Okay. Uh, because of course, as an entrepreneur, there, you know, there's an, a different skill set that is demanded of you. Yeah. And as an employee, again, there could be some variation. So I like that aspect because then it also keeps the employers on toes, you know. Okay. And oh, so it's not necessarily <laughs> a problem, is it? It's not necessarily. It depends okay. on how you look at it. Okay. Uh, for, I think for as long as there's no conflict of interest, mm -hmm. I think that diversity really, really is rich because then they understand the business also from an, an employer's perspective, mm -hmm. um, which is very healthy for the employer. However, also that means they can be too demanding you know, because yeah. of, of their expectations. And here is, uh, especially for the entry level, who really haven't gotten a lot of experience, um, they sometimes come with unrealistic expectations. You know, like, I, I really want to drive the car now. Yeah. I want to earn a six-figure salary now. You know, all those things. Yeah. Without necessarily um, putting in the, the time, you know, the element of time is what... Um, is, 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 is lacking. So the effort is there, but uh, to complement the effort, then there has to be, you know, passage of time. Yeah. Because even for anyone to develop any expertise in any area, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. So we can't really circumvent that uh, aspect of time, which is something I, I would encourage them to, you know, embrace and embrace positively. Um, but aside from that, I also see they have, and, and that speaks into my earlier statement, uh, a very low self of, self of, um, sense of loyalty rather mm -hmm. to the organization because they don't look at an employer as someone or a, as an institution or as a, an, an, an entity where they want to stay for a long time. Okay. So they're looking at... Mm -hmm. They're, they've actually compartmentalized their lives, which mm. is pretty much do dish. <laughs> so, do dish. Okay. so they're happy to work for a year to gain yeah. the experience, Move you on. know, call it a wrap. And, mm. you know, it was good, it was real. Um, so that means the employer then has to look at ways of engaging this workforce for the period they're there. Uh, probably trying to, um, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, lengthen their stay, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe not necessarily so. Also look at just tapping that that talent when it is there and it is engaged, because tomorrow is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. That's that's um, yeah. that's very interesting. And um, I don't know, Joyce, what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's um, it's um, healthy for, for the employee, for example, bearing in mind that you also need to accumulate a pension for retirement or even for the organization, because if you have high turnaround, it means you have to retrain new new employees. Is it is it a, a healthy culture that we've created as a generation? Uh, it's not a healthy culture. You know, as HRs, we are measured on staff retention. No. It's a key thing to us. So we really don't like when we are losing staff every other time, going back to the recruitment process. As we said, technology has helped us in the recruitment process. However, the recruitment process still stands to be lengthy. To onboard a staff from the recruitment to the onboarding is quite a lengthy process. And we might not want to keep on really uh, recruiting every other time. Maybe, again, from my perspective, I think, um, and I'll give an example. So a Gen Z uh, employee wants to come in in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, do what it is that they've been contracted to do, mm -hmm. and at lunchtime tell you, oh. goodbye. I'm, I'm done. done. My day you is know, done. My day is done. Mm -hmm. So that means that as employers and even as HR professionals, then because this is the workforce that is now coming into you know the work environment mm -hmm. we need to be proactive to set in place policies that sort of bring bring a balance mm -hmm. yeah because mm -hmm. in as much as um that aspect of their life is good and working for them as um she said it it can also really really destabilize a business especially because if um you're not able to depend on this person, you know. So it's more of teaching them the, the, the attitudes that will help them um, get what it is they're looking for. Because okay. remember, they are looking for something. They're looking to build their expertise in whatever area. They're looking to build um, 
credibility even in their profession you know so you as a as a as a as a hr professional you have to think about what um, incentives or what initiatives or what interventions do you put in place that speak into their innate need which is the need for recognition the need for um, advancement of their careers and if you are able to tap into that whether through your policies and also through your practices then you will you know you you have you hooked them you know so um things like flexi hours depending on again of course you 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 don't need to sacrifice the interests of the business to 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 at the ex, you know um to 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 satisfy the employees because again yeah. if you're too leaning on that side yeah. then you know the you miss the whole suffer. point yeah. so but realistically what can you do to support them so it could be probably two hours later two hours earlier but within a time that is considered okay for you to come to work yeah. for as long as you get your work done yeah. again working more with the managers because and uh, remote working has taught us now as HR professionals to really, really depend on the line managers, you know, because they are the ones who really are on the ground and know who's working, who's not working, who's, you know, basically... And they would most to... likely be older, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe not necessarily, okay. but in terms of just a touch point, they are... Um, we, we, we sort of manage the people through them okay. a lot. Mm-hmm. And now there's uh, more reliance on, on the manager. So how do you empower the manager so that they're also able to translate or basically uh, clearly communicate the um, business um, strategy mm-hmm. as well as follow up to ensure that these people are you know, doing what they're supposed to do okay. and then also giving them space to be. You know, yeah. so it could be um, social engagements that keep them active, you know, and will not necessarily cost the employer too much, time you know, too much time or money. Or it could be um, initiatives that also help bring out their other skills that they may not necessarily show at the workplace, but their skills that are necessary and they matter to them, you know, um, in a way that they feel my employer supports my you know my growth in this area which yeah. is outside probably what i do from on a day to day basis yeah oh uh, it's been a common practice that if it's disciplinary it's hr mm-hmm. hr is the one who hires sends people home and all that we are changing the narrative such that we empower the line managers to be able to also mm-hmm. correct staff upon seeing maybe a mistake this line manager is able to speak to our staff and let them know we need to do A, B, C, D. The rest we don't need to do. So in such a way, we are also shifting the we are shifting the empowerment towards the line managers, such that it might not also come always come out that HR is the people who yeah are here to send us home. <laughs> and also another way is by also being there for the staff eh, and encouraging them every other time having this um, off-work uh, engagement with staff, mm-hmm. uh, it really brings them closer. And also having the open-door policy, we, like every other time, a staff, any other time a staff can be able to come to your office and also be able to talk to you. Uh, in that note, we're able to really get so much from the staff and they can even be open and talk to you as much. So we're re- really looking forward to coming up with ways of really staff being more engaged through the HR department rather than seeing the HR as a, a very harsh department. Yes, yes, definitely. You see, um, staff leave because of one to three reasons. In a way, if a staff is able to approach you with their problem, you, you're in a position to really resolve them. Once it's resolved, it gives them a really good working environment for them to really execute their tasks. In such a way, I believe they stay longer in an institution. I think, uh, first of all, it's to understand why productivity is um, going, is, 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 uh, going declining. declining. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I'm a strong believer in asking why, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's seen as a not a very good question. But I think if you always remain uh, curious, 
then you will get the answers that you're looking for because for everything you see there's a root cause so it's to first of all understand what is the root cause and that's uh, something that maybe may be best managed or maybe best understood by the person managing the say the person with a lower productivity and then um, so that then the right intervention can be put in place so it could be um, Low, the, 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 the different reasons why an employee's uh, productivity declines, you know, some of it is, um, has nothing to even do with the employee. So again, that's where you come in as an employer to be a caring employer, but still firm, you know, in a firm way, because at the end of the day, the contract of employment is uh, pegged on performance, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in as much as you may want to really understand where the employee is at, um, you may give them interventions that help address the areas where there are concerns, mm -hmm. um, but then also put an expectation that even as we do this as an organization, mm -hmm. we are requiring to see a different kind of output, which is the, you know, the expected level of um, performance. Yeah. So, so that if that is not working, then you use the framework that uh, we've been given by the Employment Act which is now to put an employee on PIP, Performance Improvement Plan. Mm -hmm. so, um, so at that point, it's pretty much at the tail end of that conversation that we, we've been trying different interventions. Um, the person maybe has been inconsistent. Um, you've given it time, you know, you've supported in whatever way possible. Um, and then the person who is being supported if they're still not putting effort and then they're put on uh, the PIP, if it doesn't work, then unfortunately you have to cut the ties. Okay. That's sometimes uh, a bit hard for employees to hear. Um, my, you know, being one as well. Yeah. <laughs> but it is an, a reality that um, the yeah. employment contract is pegged on performance. Okay. Yeah. Once an employee is, of, is not in their right state of mind, clearly they cannot perform their job well. And as I had previously said, uh, being an engaging HR, you will be able to really understand the needs of your staff. And also through the course that you study on industrial psychology and also on human psychology of the staff, the psychology of the staff, you already know different people in your organization, how they react to different things. So at any given day when a staff comes in in the morning, you're able to know so-and-so is not in the right state of mind today. So we begin our discussion from there, identifying a problem where it is. As a HR, as you said, if your door is an open door policy, is your approach is an open door policy, the staff will even come to you before you even see the problem. And through that, you're able to discuss with them. Currently, we are engaging mental health experts to really take through our workforce through the issue. It's such a big issue currently. And uh, our short-term plan is to really look at the ones that are currently, our plan is to look at those that are existent and also look at the bigger plan whereby how do we prevent it from really eating up into our workforce. Mm -hmm. So it's a really big issue at the moment and it really affects uh, the workforce. Um, I'd say they each have a personal responsibility to monitor their mental health, you know, because you you know when things start going south, or at least have an inclination. And um, the other thing is empower, empower yourself with knowledge about mental health, you know, because sometimes people go down that slippery slope because they have no knowledge, you know, no knowledge that... Um, these are signs of depression, you know, these are signs of, you know, one to three. So how do you get that knowledge so that you're well equipped, so that if you get um, stressing environments, um, or rather stressors, the bad stressors, they're not pulling you down, you know, or at least you're able to know I need help and I need to call on the next available person, you know. Mm -hmm. um, also learning coping mechanisms or coping skills. Because in life, you will, there will always be uh, stressors, um, whether at work or at home. So how do you cope you know, with everything that's happening? And the other thing is checking up on each other you know, at the workplace, especially before COVID. The fact that we all used to be in the office, 
management, I spent a lot of time with my colleagues, you know. And of course, within my circle, there's one or two people who really, really knows me and can say, well, Elena today looks like she's having a rough day, you know. Mm -hmm. So can I, you know, just nudge her a little bit and find out what's happening, are you fine, you know, because sometimes it's easier to talk to someone who you can relate with than someone who's, you know, just yeah. out yeah. there. So okay. it's, it's and, and also just surrounding themselves with positivity, you know, because especially, again, when the pandemic began, it was mostly doom and gloom, you know, yeah. a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety. And even as we've seen, say, the, the new variant that has come in, there are a lot of losses that we are, you know, we are processing. Initially, we were processing losses of livelihoods. Now we are processing more, you know, deaths and, and that can get really, really dark. Mm -hmm. So it's just to find a support system yeah. and be able to be vulnerable in that space with them. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, thanks a lot. Um, I, I'm pretty sure for everyone who has been listening to this discussion, we've all learned a lot. Um, I personally have gained a lot and I, I hope um, you both have also um, gained from, from this discussion. Um, as we conclude, I'd like to invite you maybe to give us a little bit of, of, of your, uh, as a parting shot, what, what is your uh, assessment or your view of where the HR industry is going um, in, the, in the coming years, in, 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 in the short term and long term future from, from where you sit, starting with you, Joe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the short term uh, is to really look to it that our processes in the company, in the business, actually it's long term, eh? the business processes are in line with the HR function. So we're looking to it that this is achieved. And also in the long term, we are looking at HR also being much involved in the business. As a HR person, you need to understand the business and also be involved pretty much in it. And also to bring forth the department to collaborate well with other departments. Great. Thank you. Elena? From yeah, me? I think for me, I'd say technology first. So automating a lot of HR processes. And I'm sure for the uh, companies that have maybe fully automated HR systems, um, they can say that now that's where the HR work begins. You know, mm -hmm. after automating is when HR work begins. Mm -hmm. So I guess to be more human, because um, as we get into the new era, and even as we are, as we continue to be in this space, um, we see a lot of now um, uh, mm -hmm. social distancing, which uh, at at some point now we'll create a deficiency in social skills, you know, and how do we then prepare these people? Because they're going to come into the workplace, you know, and they don't really have the social skills. They've been, you know, doing TikTok behind doors and they're very confident. But then when they come out, they don't know how to relate with, you know, person X or, you know, <laughs> so how do you prepare for that workforce and how do you anticipate their needs in a way that you start training them or even speaking to now learning institutions from a point of how do you please ready this before so that as they come into the workforce, they sort of have some semblance of what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Um, uh, now I'd like to invite you, your comments as uh, for, for everyone who has been tuning into this discussion. Please share some comments in the chat section. Um, and you can also follow us on, on Twitter, which is at brightermonke, on Instagram at brightermondayke, and on link, LinkedIn and Facebook is Brighter Monday Kenya. So do send us your comments, your feedback, your, your views, um, whether you agree or have a different perspective of what has been shared here today. We'd really like to hear from you. And please do share this video with, with um, your friends and colleagues, and let's all um, take part in this uh, discussion. I've been your host, Boniface Mwali. Uh, thank you very much, and see you next time.